So, welcome everybody. Um, so, uh, this is like this invited address of uh, Ryan Hai. Uh, let me present you, uh, introduce you, uh, uh, Ryan. Uh, so, Ryan was born in, in Jamaica and grew up in South Florida. Um, he was studying at Palm Beach uh, Community College and uh, appreciating already mathematics and playing basket, uh, school, in the school basketball team. So Ryan transferred to uh, Georgia Tech uh, where he did some undergraduate research on soap films, uh, rotating drops and constantly curvature surfaces before moving to Berkeley for um, grad school and where he was involved in research uh, on partial differential equation and wrote a thesis on PD eigenvalue problems arising in uh, math finance. So then uh, Ryan went uh, onto a postdoc at Courant in New York, uh, where he studied like uh, viscoelastic fluids. Um, and since uh, 2012, he's been like on, a on the faculty at UPEC. So he's still doing PDEs, uh, arising in particular in uh, control theory or calculus of variations, fluid dynamics. And he's going to talk uh, today about like uh, uh, Hamilton Jacobi uh, equations. So I guess, Ryan, I leave you. Thank you. Thanks, Yannick, for the uh, uh, kind introduction. Okay, let me see if I can manage to share my screen here. Yes, okay, can, can you see my, Yanni, can you see my screen? I do, I do. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Okay, so thanks again, Yannick, for the kind introduction. And um, I wanna say a special thank you to uh, the organizers of this joint mathematics meeting for all their hard work um, behind the scenes. Um, um, it's, it's a great pleasure and honor to uh, be here today. I have the opportunity to tell you about one of my favorite topics in mathematics, um, as Yannick mentioned, uh, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Um, the story of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation begins um, uh, very simple, very, um, um, very elementary. Um, it, <clears throat> um, it begins in classical mechanics. Um, and you may recall one of the basic questions in classical mechanics is, um, is to describe the motion of a particle subject to force. Um, so um, many of the examples we'll discuss today, um, I'll try to keep the equations as simple as possible. And so um, typically the particles will just move along a line. Um, so if we have a particle here moving along the, the x-axis or the orange dot, let's see if my, yeah, the orange dot um, indicates the point mass and moves back and forth along the x-axis. And if it's subject to a force F, which depends on its position, which I denote here by gamma, S is the time variable, then we can use Newton's second law, the classical F equals MA, to write down an equation, and in particular, an ordinary differential equation for the coordinates of this particle. And so um, this is where differential equations comes in to, uh, to, in hopes to describe the motion of the particle. The dots here denote differentiation, just classical uh, notation. Okay, so this is something probably a lot of you um, have seen or have some experience with going back to uh, um, early physics classes. Um, another way this equation arises um, is through what's known as a least action principle um, or Hamilton's principle. So if the force takes a specific form, um, in particular, if it's the derivative of minus V, so F is minus V prime is indicated right here. In this case, um, V has the interpretation as potential energy. And what we can do is, is, uh, is consider a variety of paths. So we wanna describe the path that describes the motion of the particle. And there are many candidates for such paths. So we call one zeta. And um, if zeta is the, uh, is the, the path of the, of the particle, then we can compute the integral of its kinetic energy minus its potential energy. And we 
give that a name, we call it the action. Okay, and what Hamilton noticed is if I have a path gamma that has smaller action than any other path zeta, um, where all these paths are constrained to have the same beginning and end points as indicated here in this picture. So here are three paths, of course, there could be as many as we like um, that start at this point and end at this point, you know, at this point in time zero, this point in time t, um, then gamma, so again, gamma having least action among all competitor paths, necessarily satisfies the, the differential equation on the previous slide. The differential equation coming from Newton's law. Again, I remind you here that F is minus V prime. So this is that same differential equation. Okay, and so this is um, an important observation because um, it connects um, a basic problem in mechanics, finding the motion of a particle to optimization. Um, and of course, in that particular example, I mean, you know, for a given force, a lot of time is pretty simple um, what to do, but in, in many more involved models, this, this action principle makes, uh, makes all the difference. I, I'd also like to mention that any critical point of the action also satisfies this um, condition, this equation from uh, Newton's law, but we'll, we'll stick to, uh, to minimizers. Okay, this action integral, the one written here in this pink box, uh, also is known to be a solution of a certain differential equation, partial differential equation. Okay, and so how does that work? Well, if we look at solutions to, to the Newton's second law differential equation, so gamma as before, um, but we, we consider the, the ending time t, so it's a solution on the interval zero to t, and we look at the ending time t, and we look at paths that equal x at t. So it satisfies the Newton's second law differential equation, uh, hopefully describes our particle, and it happens to be equal to x at t. Then what we can do is we can plug this guy back in, this, this solution back into our action. Um, so gamma, so I've, you know, I've tried to write it as simple as possible, but gamma, you know, you, you could think about it as depending on t and x implicitly. So if we plug this in, we get a, a, an expression here, which depends on t and x in some, perhaps some involved way. Uh, but nevertheless, if the resulting function, which I'll just label as u right now, which is our action evaluated, the way to interpret this is the action evaluated along a minimizing path. Well, it satisfies um, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. I say the, th there are many Hamilton-Jacobi equations. So a Hamilton-Jacobi equation, this one, right here in this pink box. And it's a, a basic example of a partial differential equation, a nonlinear partial differential equation. Um, partial because it involves the variables, a function with more than, a function of more than one variable. So we have a time derivative here and we have an x derivative here and, and things match up just in the right way so that we get, you know, we get zero. So this was a nice observation, but I think it was mostly curious at first sight um, this is, uh, you know, 19th century mathematics. Um, but the interest in these types of equation grew in the last oh, few hundred years, and in particular, going through the Industrial Revolution and going through um, various um, modeling periods in um, engineering and defense modeling and so forth. Any, it turns out any problem where you're, you're trying to minimize or maximize a criteria um, where the underlying objects are paths, whether conti continuous or discrete time paths, usually there's a Hamilton-Jacobi equation lurking. Um, so these, these types of equations have been around for a while and have appeared in oh, seemingly countless models. The new thing this last generation, the last 40 years or so, is that mathematicians actually figured out ways to study solutions um, rigorously. And so, uh, the goal, some of the goals of my talk, uh, probably the primary goal is to show you um, kind of the key idea that unlocked, um, to, well, to give you a feel for the key idea that unlocked how we, how we interpret um, solutions, how we're able to uh, understand them and, and pretty much show that the, the objects involved, like in this case, the action is, is, is actually um, the, the solution we think it is. And then I wanna give you a hint on how we can use these solutions to design uh, minimizing paths. Um, and then at the end, time permitting, um, I, will, uh, 
I'll show you a couple of things that I think um, are of interest today, or at least are of interest to me. Uh, but before um, really getting into the, the details or with this equation, I want to discuss a few examples for you that just show you, um, give you a hint at the breadth of the, the modeling that can be done um, with uh, this equation or models that involve this equation. Okay, so whoops. Uh oh. Okay, here we go. All right, so um, the first problem, first example we'll look at is escape of a light ray. So imagine. Um, being in an inhomogeneous medium and uh, shining a light ray. So you could be in, um, you know, you just be in, the, be in your normal space, um, but maybe there's inhomogeneities due to various things, or you could be maybe um, underwater and things are a little cloudy and you, 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 you shine a light. And so um, the inhomogeneity will affect, um, you know, the, uh, the path of the light. Um, so, so my graph here, so I'm imagining uh, shining a two-dimensional light in a two-dimensional domain. These, these colors here, just, um, they're, they're schematic, just to indicate that we, uh, we have an inhomogeneity. So you may be in one space that's inhomogeneous inhom, inhom, and you're shining a light and you want to see what happens. So the light here emanates from this brown dot and these gammas are possible paths that the light may take. The inhomogeneity um, sometimes could come with a function that limits the speed of the light. And so that's this function C that you see right here. So gamma is a potential path of the light ray. And um, um, with our inhomogeneity, we assume that the light ray, the speed is controlled by C. So gamma dot, the length of, uh, of the path at the time S, is controlled by C of gamma. So C is an upper bound, typically a positive function. It could just be one everywhere, but let's just keep it as a given positive function for now. And according to Fermat, Fermat Fermat's last theorem, Fermat's principle is that the light ray assumes a path that takes the least amount of time to, in this case, exit the region. All right, and so that's our problem, finding the path of least escape time. All right, so that's an interesting, or it was an interesting problem for some time. And connected with Hamilton-Jacobi equations is the, is, is the following function. So we can label our dot, our brown dot here as, uh, as x, y. And there's really nothing special about this particular brown dot. It could be anywhere in this region. And so we just define this function u to be the minimal escape time at that point. So it's the minimum escape time of gamma, where gamma is a path that starts at the at that uh, brown dot at that point x y and satisfies the, the speed constraint. And it turns out that u satisfies the PDE, which is also known as the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, at the bottom of the screen. So the function c c of x y um, times um, this quantity, which is really it's just a way to write the length of the gradient of u, is equal to one. And um, I think this actually was the first Hamilton Jacoby written down as I was doing a little research preparing this talk. Um, I stumbled on the Wikipedia page and um, this was the earliest reference that, uh, that I found uh, authored by none other than um, William Rowan Hamilton in, in, in 1833. There may have been earlier instances, but this is the first that I know of. So um, part of what we'll discuss today is how to interpret you as a solution. Okay, another example, um, coming from uh, economics is um, the production of a given commodity, okay? And now, you know, um, a factory could produce many things. Uh, I'm just imagining a factory producing um, just one item just for the sake of uh, simplicity. Um, so we have a, a, an item, a commodity that's being produced and we, um, so this is occurring on a time horizon, zero to capital T. <laughs> right here and um, z represents the level of the commodity that you have at time s and what we get to tune um, is 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 uh, c the production rate so it's an, assumed to be a non-negative function and we assume that d is a fixed demand rate so we're producing a commodity there's a fixed demand rate which is a highly convenient assumption but we get to control how much we produce and we may be interested in minimizing a certain cost. Um, so this is just one example. There could be, I mean, there are 
plenty out there, plenty that we can imagine. So the first term represents a, a type of holding cost or an inventory cost. If we're producing loads of this stuff, it may cost us more to store it. And there's some sort of cost associated with, or you might imagine there's a cost associated with just producing the item. And so um, here we just write C squared over two, really for convenience, um, just for illustrative purposes. And so there's an optimization problem. How do you choose C to minimize this, this cost? All right, well, that's a problem of its own, right? But tying, to, uh, tying this into Hamilton Jacobi equations, we can argue as follows. Well, um, for every time T less than capital T, um, we can consider the following quantity, which is U of X T, which is the least cost where X is the level that the commodity is at time X. Oh, sorry, X is the level of the commodity at time T. So um, fast forward a little bit from zero to time T and if our commodity is right here, well, we can consider this minimization and we can do this for every X and T, it gives us a function. And it turns out that this U satisfies the PDE at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so that involves time and the space derivative um, I forgot to mention on the previous slide, these minuses and pluses here um, are positive and negative parts of, of the given quantities, um, but that's not so important for right, right now. The, the, the takeaway is that, well, there's, at first, at least there's a mathematical object to look at and we get these equations and we have natural candidates um, for the solutions. And, and there's still the question, which I haven't um, tried to answer for you is, okay, well, you know, so what? So we can solve it, can it, can it help us do something? And, we, uh, I promise we'll come back to that. Okay, so that's a second example. And our third example, um, well, we're, uh, we're in a global pandemic. And so um, there's been lots of discussion on, on what to do, how to model uh, coronavirus. Um, um, after the 1918 uh, flu, there, I mean, loads of models popped up. Probably the simplest one is a so-called SIR model. Um, which is you, you partition your po total population into three groups, susceptible, infected, and recovered portions. And you can write down differential equations for each one and try to understand the dynamics. So here's one such instance. This is not the, um, the end all be all, it's just one way to uh, approach this modeling. And um, so S again is our, our susceptible. So these are, tend to be functions of time Usually you have SI and capital R. The capital R actually drops out, it decouples. And so I, I just decided to leave it out. But uh, my S and my I functions, I may assume satisfy these differential equations. So gamma is the uh, recovery rate of the uh, population, beta is the infected rate. And given the time, and it's interesting to put in a function R here, little r, which represents a, a, a rate of vaccine. Okay. so. I should mention, I, I was looking at this model long before these vaccine considerations came about, but it's interesting now that um, um, we're trying to understand how to, how to ramp that up. Um, okay, so what's the problem I'm interested in? Oh, actually, before I say that, so S and I, even though these equations might look a little involved, um, they always, for given positive initial conditions, they always have solutions, it turns out. The S, um, all these S and I are positive and R is assumed to be positive or not negative. So S is always decreasing, um, which is convenient. Um, the I may be decreasing or it has at most one mode. It goes up and it comes down and conveniently in this model, the I, excuse me, the I tends to zero as T goes to infinity. And so given any epsilon, any small number less than the um, initial infected um, population, I will hit epsilon at some time, call that tau r. Okay, I write super r here, just to indicate that the r depends on the tau, the, the, the time, first time that I dress below epsilon depends on r. And what we wanna do is choose r, the vaccination rate to minimize tau. And so we call that an eradication time problem, right? We wanna eradicate the, uh, the disease as quickly as possible. <laughs> And what we can do is, is similar to before, we can define a function u of x, y, um, which, um, how's that defined? Well, it's the least tau r, it's the, it's the, it's the smallest um, uh, eradication time, but we, uh, we put a constraint. Um, 
that R be between zero and one. If I can ramp R up to be anything I want and vaccinate everyone immediately, then, then obviously there's really nothing to do. And as we're seeing in our own society, they're just natural to have constraints on the, the vaccine. It's just, uh, just logistically, that's just the way it goes. So, th so this is a really um, simple model here. Um, or simple policy, simple constraint to put on our vaccination rate. And so here's the same picture that we had before. So here S of zero is X. So I'm labeling the initial conditions. I of zero is Y. And we can study this function for every X and every Y. And it turns out that this U can be interpreted as a solution of this PDE at the bottom of the screen, which I'll also call a Hamilton uh, Jacobi equation. Okay. So uh, it turns out, like, like I mentioned, I studied um, along with some collaborators of mine, Dennis P and Terrence Pendleton, um, in an MSRI program uh, last summer, you know, all quarantined at home. Um, we studied uh, this model. They will speak about this uh, tomorrow, and uh, I think it's the adjoint session tomorrow afternoon. So if you want to know more about this, more about the details, um, that's an opportunity for you. We also have a preprint up on archive. Feel free to take a look and um, let me know what you think. Okay, so here we, so we've seen a few examples now with uh, any sort of, you know, minimization over past lead to Hamilton Jacobi equation. And I want to go back to that problem that we started with the one in mechanics. Okay, why? Because, well, the math is just, it turns out a little bit simpler. And um, I think it's just, it's just easier to, to wrap our heads around. Um, so I'm not giving you the general theory. I just, I want to focus on this particular example, but I think of you can take a few things away. You'll, you'll understand quite a bit about what, uh, what happens in general. So here we're gonna return to our action integral. We're gonna, so let's just assume that the mass of the, the particle we have in mind is one. And uh, we look at paths, potential paths to describe the motion of the particle um, that all equal X at T. So for a moment, fix X and fix T. And we look at all paths that are constrained to have this right endpoint. And then we consider the action just as before. So kinetic energy minus potential. And um, just as we saw in those few examples, it makes sense to define a function. So this function, we will call the, uh, the optimal value function, All right, That's a typical value or optimal value function is typical uh, terminology and control theory. And so, um, so it, it is the function that, um, that we get when we minimize the action, given the constraint, what the constraint here is as simple as can be, just that um, z of t is equal to x. And we also just throw on a function here, we just add it in. It may seem like an unnecessary, um, you know, like why at this point, oh, no, Siri, I don't want you. Uh -oh, okay, so, um, but we'll see that it, um, it's convenient. It'll it'll be convenient for us later. If you want, you can think of G to be zero right now. Um, but we'll, we'll we'll use it later. Okay. So here we have our value function. Okay. And as mentioned a few times, we're pretty sure that there's a PDE, the Hamilton Jacobi equation associated with you. How do we get there? Well, the main tool is the so-called dynamic programming principle or Bellman's principles. It was um, discovered, um, um, popularized, used by Richard Bellman, um, an applied mathematician who worked many years with the Rand Corporation. Um, and what he noticed was that if I understand the value function at intermediate times, in particular, let's say I want to understand the value function at time t. Well, if I understand it at time s, then I can use those values to determine what it is at time t. Okay, so that's one heuristic. Another heuristic is there's just a relationship. There's a natural relationship between optimal values. So we see that u of xt is equal to the minimum of u of zeta of s and s. And now I do the integral from little s to t. And so kind of an intermediate problem, if, if I know u at time s, if we can act optimally up until time s, then we only need to compute the integral from s to t and take a minimum and we actually get the same thing that we, we started with. And, um, and so this is really a, um, um, what's a good way to put it, um, you know, a, um, a, a kind of a, a non-infinitesimal version of the, uh, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. The Hamilton-Jacobi equation, what I'm gonna convince you, try to convince you with shortly is that it 
it, it follows almost directly from this equation. Okay, so S here is less than T and differential equations involve derivatives. And so at some point we might like wanna let S go to T. So what we'll do, we need, we need some sort of quotient. We'll take this U of XT. We'll think of XT being fixed for the moment. So U of XT is just a number. Um, oh, I get one more technical thing um, before I, you know. So this function U, so I'm writing min everywhere. So really I probably should write an infimum and not just assume that there's always a minimum, but um, I won't worry too much about that. We won't lose much in what I'll share with you without worrying about that technical detail. Um, so in any case, I'll subtract U from both sides and divide by T minus X and let's see what happens. Okay, so let's focus here on this, this purple box. So I, I subtracted U of X T and that gave me this term right here because, whoops, excuse me. So U of Zeta T is U of X T because Zeta of T is X, that's our constraint. And this was the term we had um, from our dynamic program and we divide by T minus X, okay, which is a positive number, S is less than T. And then what we wanna do is, is send S to T. Okay, so um, for the moment, um, if we just do that inside these curly brackets, well, this is just a derivative. Okay, I need to use a chain rule, but it's just a derivative. And so I get a time derivative and I get an X derivative, but I need to take the derivative of Zeta and multiply it. But um, I just call that V. Um, and that could be any real number because um, these paths are constrained to be equal to X at time T, but there's no constraint on the derivative. So that could be any number. And this is just the, you know, I'm just dividing by the length of the interval, the integral, and I'm integrating from S to T. So if I take a limit, well, fundamental theorem of calculus tells me I get this expression. So that's if I could take the limit on the inside of the brackets, but I really have this minimum, but let's uh, not worry about that. And we just take the, the limit, you know, we interchange the limit in the minimum. Usually it's a dangerous thing in analysis to do this, but uh, we just go ahead and do it, throw caution to the wind. And um, if you buy that, then the expression I get from sending T to S, sorry, sending S to T from below in this purple box is this first line right here. Okay, but the, the nice thing is that now I just have a minimization of a quadratic function in V, you know, in one variable. And so that I can, um, I can do, that's a solvable mathematical problem. And so when I do that, I end up, you know, lo and behold, with the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Okay, I have these minus signs, but it's the same expression I had, uh, same equation I had before, before I had M equal, you know, there's an M somewhere, but M equals one. And so uh, assuming differentiability of the value function and that I could do this, uh, this interchange of min and limit, I get the, uh, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So, um, so in summary, let's, let's just look back at uh, what we've done. So I've defined, so I've taken my action. And so I added on this function G, I said, let's look at this minimum. I noticed, well, you know, through Bellman's principle that U satisfies a certain dynamic programming and in the limit, in the limit of that, uh, that principle, um, I see that, well, at least heuristically that U satisfies this PDE. And moreover, now is a good time to note that, well, if T is zero, then this integral goes away and G of zeta of zero would just be X. And so U of X zero is G. And so we see that U is actually naturally considered a solution of an initial value problem. Okay, Siri, please go away. Sorry, Siri. Okay, good. All right. So U is naturally a solution of, um, of this initial value problem. Okay, so that, that's great. I mean, there's, there are a couple of technical things I wanna come back to um, on how U solves this equation because there are a couple of hand wavy steps. Um, but I also like to take the, the opportunity to note that if U, if we have U, if we know it everywhere, you know, as a function of X and T and it satisfies this equation, then we can actually use it to design a minimizing path for a given X and T. So if we know the entire function U, then I can use it to, uh, to, to find one minimizing trajectory. And how do I do that? Well, in this particular case, so you can do it in all the examples that I showed you, or at least you have a, a recipe to do it. It may or may not work how you want. 
or you have a, a, a way to do it. And in this particular problem, what you do is, okay, so X is fixed and T is fixed. And I look at, you know, if I know U, I just solve this ODE, gamma dot is partial X U, gamma of S S, so I solve it backwards. And what I notice is that, okay, well, U of X T is equal to U gamma of T of T because X is equal to gamma. Then I can just use a fundamental theorem of calculus now, right? So this function is its value at zero and I integrate from zero to T and I take a derivative. Okay, that's easy enough. Now I can use two things. I can use one that gamma satisfies this equation and that U is a solution to the Hamilton-Jacobi equation and some algebra. So I'm not showing you the algebra. It's, it's rather, it's elementary, not too interesting, but we actually get the same expression that we, you know, we had in mind, the action. And so that means U defined as the minimum of all such paths is, is equal to, um, the minimum of the action in G along such paths is, is, uh, is equal to uh, this particular path. I mean, this expression valued on this particular path. And so um, knowing you gives us a recipe to, uh, to find minimizing trajectories. My guess is that's why Bellman and the control theorists and the, the engineers and so forth were interested in the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Okay, 36. All right, so, so this is all fine and dandy. We have the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. We have a, a way to get the optimality condition. All of this relies on smoothness of the value function that I can, I can take that limit to derive the equation, that I could use a chain rule um, in this little calculation. So that relies on differentiability. And unfortunately, it turns out that the value function in general is not everywhere differentiable, just inconveniently, it turns out. And Bellman knew this. Um, many people, they, they all grappled with it and, and um, devised tricks of getting around it. They still wanted to use it because they thought it was fundamental, but it was only in the 80s. So, I mean, you're going from 1833 to 1982, so about 150 years that the, the well, I'm just gonna go ahead and say it, the right way to look at these equations was discovered by Michael Crandall and Pierre-Louis Lyons, um, who in a, in a seminal paper, a seminal work, um, presented their notion of what's now known as viscosity solutions. Okay, so I've rewritten the, uh, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation for you right here. Okay, and the normal thing, when you have a differential equation, you just want to take a couple of derivatives, plug stuff in and you get zero and okay, life is good, you know, go out for lunch and celebrate, you got a solution. Um, as I said, the, uh, the, the value function being the natural candidate for this, uh, the solution to this equation, just, it's just not everywhere differentiable. And so, okay, you could look at almost everywhere differential and so forth, but that, that, that's also lacking for some reasons I'm not gonna go into. Um, but okay, here, here's what is true. That if I, I take my value function, which may or may not be smooth, they tend to be continuous, but uh, not necessarily differentiable. So let's say it may have like a kink here at this point, x zero, t zero. If I can touch it from above, by a smooth function phi. So if I can just come right from above and just, just, just touch it right at that point, then phi has to satisfy this differential inequality at the point x zero t zero. Okay, so um, yeah, that's what's true. And conversely, um, conversely, if, if I can touch you from below at a point x zero t zero, then by smooth function psi, so I touch it from below as, as indicated in this picture, then psi satisfies the opposite differential inequality. Uh, any function which has uh, both properties is known as a viscosity solution. And it turns out that the value function is uniquely specified. This is also, this was in that seminal paper, kind of, and Leo's proved that the, um, this, the value function is the unique viscosity solution with the initial condition G. So U of X zero equals G. You need some assumptions. So here we have the potential V and there's that initial condition G. So there, there's some assumptions that one needs to uh, observe, but uh, generally speaking, U is uniquely specified. And um, this is just a powerful theorem. And now, you know, I've built up to it and you might think, okay, great. That was the end. No, that, that, you know, that's the end of the day. That was just the beginning 
Um, so here's just one equation, and this is the type of equation they studied in that paper, although with more variables, um, more spatial dimensions. This is just one spatial dimension, but you can study um, a variety of equations, equations which don't involve time, equations which are second order, which involve minimization over random paths, um, uh, equations which don't yield continuous solutions, various asymptotic problems. It, it really um, opened up the field and then um, field of study in terms of uh, um, theory for, for these types of PDEs than anything else. So Siri keeps coming back. Please go away, Siri. Okay. Um, and so, uh, well, in any case, I hope I've given you some idea of, um, of viscosity solutions. And so in the remaining time here, I wanna, I wanna tell you about a few things, at least one thing, maybe two things that I'm interested along these lines, you know, something that I think, uh, it, you know, is of interest today among PDE and uh, control theorists. Okay, so the first is interacting particles. Okay, so, all right, so there's a lot to unpack here in the, in, unpack here in this slide, but um, uh, the, the main thing is, the main thing I'm trying to model and describe is if I have a bunch of particles that are on a common line, like the x-axis, so say n particles, and these particles interact with each other. You know, maybe there's some um, gravitational interaction or some electromagnetic interaction or some sort of interaction between the particles. So they feel each other. They know, you know, each particle gets a little bit of action, uh, interaction from another particle, depending on how big they are, according to their, their masses. And the particles may collide, all right? They may run into each other. And when they do, they join to form a bigger particle and their slopes average accordingly. Um, according, well, actually, according to the rules of perfectly inelastic collisions. Okay, so, um, so okay, here's a schematic, whoops, excuse me, of the particles moving along the x-axis. Okay, and so they move, this is according, so time is now going up, s is going up. And so, all right, so they're moving right along, interacting, you know, given some, you know, whatever particle dynamics is out there. and they may bump into each other. And when they do, like say in this, in this so M4 and M5, when they bump into each other, well, they join to form a more massive particle where their mass is some. And then when I look at the instantaneous velocity after the collision, call that W, well, W satisfy what's here in this yellow box, okay? So that means that conservation of momentum has to hold. Uh, and, and in particular, when I look at W, I can solve for W and I see W is the mass average of the uh, prior instantaneous velocity. Okay, so that's the dynamics, okay? And when I say they interact, well, there's some mathematics there. That's what's in this blue box. Okay, it's a little bit involved, but the way to interpret it is the, the force. So this is mass times acceleration. Oh, I forgot to mention. So gamma one through gamma n are the trajectories of the respective particles. So here's M6 and here's gamma six. You know, M5, gamma five would be this path. Uh, M4, gamma 4 would be this fast. So gamma 4 and gamma 5 agree after, you know, the collision. Um, so these trajectories um, in between collisions, they satisfy this system of ODE because this ODE uh, encodes exactly what I mentioned before, that the, the force on the i particle is proportional. Um, um, the force that the i particle feels is a proportional to, um, is equal to a force proportional to the mass of the jth particle. And then I add up all the forces from all the other particles. And that gives me the net force on the i particle. Okay, so W is a function that represents the interaction, W prime. And um, so a simple choice and probably the most common choice is W is either absolute value or minus absolute value. Um, but, uh, but okay, that's not so important. Just, just think of W as, as a function. And this could represent both um, a repulsive and um, attractive um, interaction. So it's all encoded here. Um, you just have to uh, take my word on it. Okay, so this is fine if they're only a small number of particles, but if they're more and more, it gets a little bit involved to study. And we can consider this averaged model. Um, actually, this average model, it, it's really an exact model. And the, the, the system I wrote down in the previous slide can actually be fit into it, but it's most naturally considered as, as a limiting description. And so here rho is the distribution of mass of the particles, the mass distribution, V is the velocity. 
And so this is a system of PDEs, so two PDEs. Um, and we call it the sticky particle system because it, it models the, the collection of particles that move around on a line that, uh, you know, particles may stick together. And when they do, they, you know, I mean, when they collide, they undergo perfectly inelastic collisions. And um, otherwise they have interaction with W. And the way that I will think about this and that I hope that you will think about this is, well, um, so the total mass is conserved. The ma mass is conserved, so the total mass is conserved. So let's just call it one. Let's assume there's finite mass, we call it one. So rho represents a, a, a mass distribution, but I can think about that as like a probability distribution. So it's a, it's a function that's not negative, it integrates to one. And so for every S, I get a probability distribution that change. So it changes, it changes in time. And these arrows here are telling you kind of what the velocity does. The velocity is pushing mass from one side to another. And, um, and then we, we so we're, can, we're basically modeling this, or I'm thinking about this as a collection of, of, uh, of densities, of probability uh, distributions that evolve over time, okay? And describe the, the, the physics that we mentioned. So in some ways, this is like Newton's equation for the single particle, except it involves a system. And just like Newton's equation, we saw from Newton's equation, well, there's a least action principle lurking. And it takes the following form for, uh, for this model, okay? So we can imagine now a competitor path. So a path in the space of probability distribution. So just like we did in the classical case, we looked at competitor paths. And so sigma is a competitor um, as a way to describe the, the physics that we want. And so sigma for, so for every S we get a distribution sigma of S and we can um, model sigma as an evolution that, um, that satisfies the continuity equation with some W. So we think of W, this velocity field as being like, a, so it's like almost like a derivative of sigma in an abstract sense. And what this integral, this action integral represents is a kinetic energy. So here we have W squared D sigma that represents like a total kinetic energy of the system. We have a bunch of particles, maybe a continuum of particles, and then we have a uh, potential energy. So it's just the analog of the action that we, we mentioned before. And there's, a, there's an action principle. So if rho is a path that has smaller action than sigma, for all sigmas that have the same endpoint distribution, the same mass distribution at time t, then rho necessarily satisfies the sticky particle PDEs, the sticky particle system. Okay, so that's great. So that was a nice observation. Um, and um, it begs the question, is there a Hamilton-Jacobi equation lurking? You know, hopefully one that's interesting. And will it tell me how to construct action minimizing paths? of this, this, uh, this bigger quantity, okay? In particular, can I use Hamilton-Jacobi theory to tell me more about this, um, this PDE system? And um, the answer is yes, it doesn't tell us everything, but the answer is yes. And um, we'll need, so in order to discuss um, Hamilton-Jacobi equation, the operative variable, so time, time is just as it was before, but the operative variable will be a probability distribution. And so um, I, I need to say just a little bit about how I consider functions um, on the space of distributions and how can I differentiate them? Okay, so I'll, I'll try to lead you through that here. Um, uh -oh. Let's see, can I move? All right, here we are. So I'm gonna write PR for the space of probability distributions on R. Okay, so you could think about them. I mean, this isn't quite right, but you could just think about the space as being non-negative functions that integrate to one. Um, it's, it's bigger than that, but you could just think about that for now, heuristically, just like a histogram. Collect data, you get a histogram. That's an example. All right, so mu, fix mu to be one of these guys. So one mass or probability distribution and fix a function phi Think about it as being a nice function, continuous, bounded, and so forth. But what I can do is I can perturb mu, right? So usually when I want to differentiate a function, I want to take a point and perturb off that point and see how my function behaves. Is there a linear approximation and so forth? Um, 
And I can do that with, with uh, probability distributions, but they're, um, you know, you, you just have to think a little bit about how do you perturb a distribution? And so this is the way that we'll do it. I'll say why it's natural in a moment. But if you give me this function phi, what I can do is I can so-called look at the identity plus epsilon phi push that pushes me forward. So, okay, that's technical terms, but okay. I wouldn't worry about that too much, but here's what, here's, here's, here's what this means. So all right, if I give you probability distribution, well, typically I wanna know how to measure, you know, the size of an interval, something like that you know, when I integrate against it, but I could also just say, well, how does it behave when I integrate a function against it? And that's simple. Well, I just take the function and I just stick, you know, H and I just compose it with this identity plus epsilon phi. So I get this guy right here. And so this, this specifies a probability distribution. And now given a function script V on this space, well, what I do is I just differentiate with respect to epsilon and set epsilon to zero. And if, 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 if there's a function such that this limit holds for every phi, we call that the derivative with respect to mu. Okay, so it may look like I just came up and got this, you know, like just, I just invented it on the spot. It turns out that the space of probability distributions has a nice metric structure and an almost manifold structure. And these guys, mu epsilon, you got to choose the right distance, but they're a geodesic. And so it's almost like taking your measure mu and pushing it in a geodesic direction and taking a derivative. And so it's natural in that sense, natural from the standpoint of uh, optimal transportation, mass, optimal mass transportation. But, uh, but anyway, so I just wanted to say a little bit about it. And the important thing about this definition, even if you, you know, even if that went all over your head is that it obeys the chain rule. Okay, so in our two equations are the conservation of mass and conservation of momentum and the conservation of mass, again, W is like a derivative of sigma. So just think abstractly, W is like sigma prime. And well, if I look at a path sigma in this abstract space, so it's just this, you know, pretty wild space, uh, the space of probability distributions. Well, it turns out that I can always pick W to have the smallest norm, smallest L2 norm with respect to uh, sigma. And if I do that, then W is considered tangent or, uh, or, or minimal at least. And the chain rule, if I differentiate a function V that's differentiable in the sense that I said on the previous slide, um, along this path sigma, then I get that same derivative that I defined times w. And so it's almost like the chain rule where I compose a function, take a derivative, and I get the derivative I started with times the derivative of the thing on the inside. Okay, and I, I, I so I've gone to great pains here to, um, um, okay, I think I have four or five minutes. Um, hopefully that's, that's right. Um, to describe this um, because um, it leads to a theory of Hamilton-Jacobi equations. So given, um, given a measure mu, we can define u of mu t, where g is a, just a given function, um, sigma of zero, where sigma is a path in the space of measures. A is that huge quantity. I'm not going to go back to it, but it's a big quantity. It's, um, it's the action, the kinetic energy, uh, minus the potential energy of the, the system of interacting particles um, that, would, that I introduce you to. And it turns out that this U is a solution of this top equation here in this purple box. So, and when we call this a Hamilton-Jacobi equation, Hamilton-Jacobi equation, it's a Hamilton-Jacobi equation in the, uh, in the space of probability distributions um, along the real line. And this derivative right here is, is the one that, that I specified for you. So partial mu, partial capital U is, is that derivative. And, um, and so U in fact turns out to be a solution, but just as in the classical setting, the U need not be smooth and differentiable like we thought. And so there's a notion of viscosity solutions. And uh, it turns out that with the right notion, it can be shown that U is, is uniquely specified and moreover, uniquely specified as a solution of this 
abstract Hamilton Jacobi equation along with this initial condition. And moreover, if u happens to be differentiable and I can solve this equation here in this dotted green box, in particular, if I can solve the continuity equation where my velocity v is given by the derivative of u um, composed with rho, then rho in fact is an optimal trajectory and it satisfies a sticky particle system. So this, um, this approach, so it's a tool, uh, well, I shouldn't say it's a tool, it's, it's an approach to try and understanding um, more complicated dynamics, whether that be in physics or economics or engineering, um, dynamics involving multiple systems, uh, multiple agents. Um, this approach has been also considered in game theory. Um, the theory of mean field games, the master equation involves um, not a hamilton jacobi equation, but an equation um, closely related and uh, involves derivatives with respect to measure. And just as I mentioned for uh, the groundbreaking work of uh, Crandall and Leones in the early 80s, um, um, this has been, um, you know, uh, this, these observations um, that I pointed out to you today, um, which have only been made in the last dozen years or so, have really been the beginning of a slew of work and a slew of interest and in, um, renewed interest in, in understanding fundamental equations in physics. And like I said, models um, where we try to optimize over uh, paths of, of interacting particles or distributions. And I think it's, um, it's really um, in a beginning phase and, um, and one that I hope to learn about more. Um, so uh, let's see with that. I think I'm just about at time and um, I'll stop here. Thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Ryan, for, for this very nice talk. So there, is, there are several questions. Um, so I think you answered like uh, the first one, like how to derive uh, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation uh, in general, because, yeah. right? Yes, that's right. So, I mean, probably when the person asked, so you can derive it, it was derived initially just through implicit differentiation. Exactly. But, um, but what I showed you um, today, even though still heuristic is, um, I think is a little bit more accepted and a little bit more intuitive. And uh, the second one is uh, explaining like the viscosity inequality. Yes, okay. So actually I prepared a little bit on that, but I figured I wouldn't have time to get to it. So let me just skip ahead. And so, um, yeah, so actually, I, 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 thank you, whoever asked that question. So here was our equation. So here's the hamilton jacobi equation right here. This was the one. So what Crandall and Leon did, so they actually, so, I mean, they didn't know everything at that moment. They, they definitely struck upon a great idea, but they, they arrived at it different than probably how we would teach it today. And what they did was they said, okay, well, this equation, albeit a little, you know, pretty simple, um, um, gives us solutions which are not differentiable, which are not smooth. If we add on an epsilon times two derivatives or in higher dimensions, this term is called a Laplacian, an epsilon Laplacian term, then even though this is a more complicated, just from abstract theory, um, fixed point arguments um, in, in abstract spaces, it's known that there is a smooth, a perfectly smooth solution of this equation. And it can be shown that u epsilon converges to u at least locally uniformly, so uniformly on compact sets. And so what they noticed is this. Well, if, if, if I have psi that touches u from below, what that means is that u minus psi has a minimum. And it turns out that u epsilon minus psi will have a minimum at a close by point at a point x epsilon t epsilon converging to x zero t zero. And because u epsilon minus psi has a minimum, well, that means that the derivatives have to, the first derivatives match up and I get an inequality. That's the crucial thing, an inequality for the second derivative. And because u epsilon satisfies this PD in this top bracket, um, then at the point x epsilon t epsilon, I get the inequality here at the bottom slide. And so what I can do now is just send epsilon to zero and this term goes away and x epsilon, assuming that the V is continuous and x epsilon um, converges to, uh, 
x0 t epsilon convergence of t0. And um, that's how they saw that, um, you know, something like this should be true. So it was a brilliant stroke, this calculation. So, um, you know, my advisor, Craig Evans, I think in one of the later chapters in his book where he talk about uh, viscosity solutions, he outlines all this uh, quite carefully. And so, yeah, it's, it was a quite a quite an observation. Another question is, uh, so the classical Amigdalian Jacobi equation is associated to a canonical transformation. Uh, so is there an analytical structure for the equation that you mentioned? Yeah, that's a good question. That's something that I never really um, understood, um, I confess. So yeah, when you do the canonical transformations, I'm not exactly sure what happens. Um, Boy, if this was a live seminar and any of my, well, actually, I mean, okay, Yannick, you're a KAM person. I was going to say, we KAM people know about this for sure. Um, but yeah, I can, I'm not, I'm not sure. It's a great question. Um, you know, what happens? What are the implications for the canonical when you go to canonical transformations? Sorry. So maybe I can do like, a, I think sure. that uh, one of the main points is that the, uh, is the theory that you develop the Lagrangian approach. Mm -hmm. KEM is, uh, I mean, as you were mentioning, like, I mean, a canonical transformation are Hamiltonian. So one need to go one to the other through like potential transformations. Yeah. I mean, and do so you see the hint? Yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead, please, please. Yeah, no, I think that there, there should be also like a canonical transformation associated, but, uh, but uh, one has to take like the Hamiltonian point of view. Yeah, I mean, there's just a touch of Hamilton. This is more Lagrange. I mean, the Hamilton Hamiltonian does come out in the PDE, but yeah. Okay, well, there's another thing I need to brush up on. Thank you for the question. Another question is like, uh, is is uh, your sticky equations in applied to galactic or stellar evolutions? Yes, I mean, it was a model. Um, it was a model. Let me go back to them. In fact, whoops, let me go back to them. So, so yeah, this is a, I mean, this is a, uh, this is a contrived model by me. So really in three dimensions, one can uh, consider this and it, and it was, and it was studied by a mathematician named Zeldovich and he popularized it and pretty late in the game, I should say. I mean, his published work come out in the late sixties, early seventies. And it was a model for early universe galaxy formation, um, you know, in very cold settings. And he threw out, in fact, the, uh, the interaction. And so if you study this in three dimensions, um, there's only a short time theory, which um, we know by the method, so-called method of characteristics, where you're building solutions by solutions ODEs, or if, if, if this W is zero, just building a solution out of straight lines, um, straight line paths. But as far as I understand, that is just a local theory. And it's only in one spatial dimension that we have a good theory. So there's, you know, it's a not physical, um, but you know, mathematically, um, we know quite a bit about it. But the three-dimensional um, system, we know a little about. And it's, there's an inherent instability there. And so people like myself who like to build solutions through compactness and various uh, arguments like that, it just, there's, there's no stability. Um, there's a certain inequality and entropy inequality that holds in, in, in one spatial dimension, even if you have a W here. So I've worked on that, written a little bit about that, but in, uh, in more dimensions, the physical case, the case of interest, um, we know very little. Some people uh, like Jan Bernier may even challenge that it's even the right model. Some people have shown that, um, like uh, Brisson and Nguyen, that um, maybe you get a solution, but it won't be physical or satisfy the sticky, the stickiness property. So, um, so I think in my mind, there's a lot to be understood. And uh, I've written a little bit about that. I wrote an article in the notices about this a few years ago, just to hopefully spark up a little interest. Um, so, so the answer is yes, it is physically founded in higher dimensions, which I didn't write for you we know just about zero. The kinetic analogs, we know uh, a lot more about, but this type of hydrodynamic um, system is, um, in my mind, completely wide open in higher dimensions. 
So I think we are related, uh, I mean, we're running a little bit out of time, but related to that, yeah, there is a question like if there is a midfield game approach system. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, okay, was it, was it just about what the approach is or what the equation is? Was there a specific question? Uh, so the question is, uh, can you write like a midfield game type system of two PDs for the sticky particle system? Um, no, I mean, there is a forward backward system. I didn't write it down, but there's a forward backward system that was studied first by Leons and Lashri, um, which is, um, which you can, you can, um, that's kind of like a characteristic equation for the uh, more general, um, well, I, I'll say this, I did prepare a few slides. I didn't get to it. I figured I would not, but, um, so here's the equation, the master equation from mean field games. Um, I don't, I don't know if there's a, um, yeah, I don't, I mean, you could do it because from the forward backward system. So I didn't, I haven't written it down here. Um, so here, so for people who are out there who are just still hanging in there. So this is the master equation from mean field games. And it's a uh, game theory tends to be hard, but um, in a certain limit, an average description um, occurs that has just been generated a slurry of interest on what's called mean field games. And so there's some simpler equations that also describe the same game theory. Um, you could differentiate, oh, sorry, Siri, get out of here. Okay, so you could, so to this person who asked, you get a forward backward equation, one with the focal plank, something like the um, continuity equation, one with the Hamilton Jacobi. You could differentiate the Hamilton Jacobi to get like a fluid equation, um, you could do it. Um, I don't know if there's really a lot there, but you, you know, at least formally, heuristically, you could differentiate the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, maybe multiply by rho, and you would have a um, an equation. But I don't know if yeah, if that's really profitable. But uh, who knows? I could be wrong. Okay, I think we are running out of time. So thanks a lot. Uh, so sorry for the other question that uh, we didn't, uh, Ryan didn't have time to answer. Yeah, but, anyone uh, can write me. I'm free this afternoon. If anyone wants to write me and discuss more, I'll be around. So but anyway, thanks for hanging in there. I know this was not ideal. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Thanks a lot. Thanks for everybody, to everyone.